Welcome to Zoom to Gettysburg is a program designed as a friendly informational discussion between LBGs, historians, authors, and guests. Program leaders and moderators require polite, courteous behavior of all participants. The LBGs and invited presenters make every effort to provide accurate historical information. However, the information provided in group discussion may be subject to different interpretation among all participants. Information shared herein does not guarantee passing and or successful completion of any test, exam, class, and or including but not limited to the NPS license battlefield guide test. Moderators reserve the right to limit discussion and comments during the program. Zoom programs may be recorded by attending. You give your permission to be recorded and published in the future. Um, our guest tonight is Eric Lindblay. Now, uh, a lot of people know Eric from his very popular The Battle of Gettysburg podcast. He's a co-host with that other guy. What's his name, Eric? I keep Jim Hess. Yeah, I'm going to tell him you said that. So. Yeah, you can, because I'm sure when he's back here in February, he'll do the same thing. But yes, Eric's going to talk tonight on a subject that I think he just knows a lot about. So Eric, I'm going to turn the room over to you. You should be able to share the screen. All right, let's see how this works here. All right. And I'm thanking you in advance, Eric. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I um, want to welcome everybody here tonight. Uh, so what I'm doing tonight is a little different. You know, a lot of what we do as guides and historians is interpret the what. You know, this event happens, this event happens, this event happens, on and on. I'm going to look at a little more the what, the why, and the how when we look at the 26th North Carolina here at Gettysburg, because I think there's a tendency to sometimes view these soldiers as merely just pieces on a chessboard. You know, you're just moving them around. But who are they? What was their lives like? Um, and see also the impact that their backgrounds have on their performance here at Gettysburg, and also the impact of the events here, what's it going to have on their homes as well. So what we're going to do is kind of take a, a look at the 26 North Carolina through kind of, I think, a different um, lens than what we normally do. So a little bit about what we're going to do. You know, I have been working longer than I like to think on a regimental history of the 26 North Carolina. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, over time, you accumulate letters, you accumulate information. My question was, though, that only gives me a limited view. You know, over 2,000 men served in the 26 North Carolina, including one woman, by the way. Uh, but we only have, that I was able to find, it's around 115 letters and diaries from individuals. So, you know, when you're looking at that number, that's not really a big chunk of the regiment. So how do we know more about them? How can I get answers from people that did not leave records or simply we do not have them today? So I started to develop the idea of what I call a socio-military profile. Try to take as much, much information about these guys as I can, compile them into data, and then sort of see what it tells me about the regiment. So one of the aspects that, that got me started with this, um, and you'll see the speech here from John Lane. Um, this is from 1903 here at Gettysburg. He's actually giving this speech by the 24th Michigan's Monument, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting dynamic. But he gives in his mind what the 26th North Carolina was. And you'll see that there's a couple things that pop out. Um, they're not aristocrats. They're mostly farmers. They, many of them did not own slaves. Uh, you know, all of these things. I thought, you know, he's giving us an insight into these men. So my question then is, does the numbers actually support what John Lane said? So we'll kind of delve into that a little bit. So, the methodology I used for this, it wasn't just me randomly putting together numbers. Um, the first thing I looked at was the 1860 census. I was very fortunate enough, I found around 80% of the regiment in the 1860 census. So pretty good records there. Also, I used their compiled military service records. Uh, basically the service records, they're gonna tell you 
some insight into when they were mustered in, when they were discharged, what they did during certain times in their military service. Also looked at pension applications. That's often a good source of information, especially when these guys are talking about getting wounded or other things. Now, keep in mind, some guys do kind of embellish on pension records a little bit. So you got to kind of watch that. Um, but also another great resource that we have as students of North Carolina Civil War history is, of course, this book right here. Um, the North Carolina Troops 1861 to 1865, a roster that if you're doing any research on the North Carolina Troops, you've got to consult it. There's just no way around it. Uh, but also I used newspaper accounts, letters and diaries, memoirs, as well as family history files uh, from the various counties that 26 North Carolina was raised from. So all of this together is what gives me this data, but numbers are only as good as what you use them for. So as we start looking into it, I used for tonight a couple samples. One was the overall profile of these guys. So 1861 to 1865, over 2,000 individuals. I also looked at the period between May and August of 1861. These are the initial enlistments or those that joined the regiment. So it's kind of an interesting subgroup to look at because there's a lot of different behaviors and different socioeconomic backgrounds to those that enlist in 1861 to those that you're going to see in the period between February and May of 1863, which we'll also look at. We're also very fortunate that we have the June 30th muster of the 26th North Carolina. We know who is in the ranks. We know they're there. So we use that uh, to give a sense of what they looked like on the eve of Gettysburg. So the first item I have here, this is a map of the great state of North Carolina. And the counties that you see in red are the primary counties that the 26 North Carolina was recruited from. Now, what you'll look at on the map here is that they're kind of spread out regionally. Um, we have this little pocket in northwestern North Carolina. Um, we have troops from Ash County, Wilkes County, and Caldwell County right through here. Um, we have troops from Wake County this is with Raleigh, the state capital, Chatham County into Moore County. And then we have these counties right here that I think are particularly interesting, uh, Anson and Union County, which today we would consider part of really the Charlotte metro area, if you're really looking at that. Now, one of the myths that I think has developed over time uh, about the 26th North Carolina is that they're a Western North Carolina regiment. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, Zebulon Vance, their first colonel, hailed from Asheville, from the western part of the state. Um, also, there is a book that came out, oh, now about 20 years ago, Covered with Glory by Rod Gregg. He puts a lot of emphasis on the men of Company F of the 26th North Carolina, which were from Caldwell County, so these guys right here. So that kind of gives the impression that they are a western North Carolina unit. Well, the map doesn't really back that up, and, and there's any number of ways you can look at this. Um, you know, generally speaking, Western North Carolina is sort of this area west. We've got the Piedmont into this area here, and then you've got the coastal plain, Eastern North Carolina. I'm going to do it through a more scientific method of describing East and West for North Carolina. I want you to look at this county right here. This is Davidson County. In Davidson County is the county seat of Lexington. Uh, that is where Western North Carolina style barbecue comes from. This area over here is where you get the bad barbecue in North Carolina, right over here. This area over here is where you get all the good barbecue. And notice I have this big black void where South Carolina is. That's mustard based. You don't want to go there at all. Uh, but all joking aside, you can see that this is a regiment from really three distinct geographic regions, which I think gives a lot of, of interesting data from, from the regiment. So let's first take a look at, at these troops. You know, how many of them resided in those primary counties, the main counties the regiment was pulled from? What you're going to look at is that overwhelmingly uh, the bulk of them come from these primary counties. What I think is also interesting is when you then look at where these men are born, are they born in North Carolina? You'll see the vast majority of them are. What we see here, for the most part, many of these men never leave their home counties until the Civil War. Think about that for a moment. You know, the county that you're in, imagine you're born there, you work there, and then you're most likely going to die there. 
So for these men to get the chance to go to the state capital of Raleigh was a big deal. Um, I have a number of great letters from these men when they're serving on the coast of North Carolina, talking about just how amazing being at the beach is. You know, you're seeing the ocean, you're seeing um, fiddler crabs. I have a great description of a guy from the mountains trying to describe a fiddler crab, which is, you know, fun reading. So we see that for the most part, these men are vast majority born in North Carolina. The vast majority are from the primary counties, which they're from. And you'll see that I have the data kind of broken up 1861, 1862 to 1863, and then the Gettysburg sample there. One of the things I also wanted to look at was literacy rate. And literacy rate is kind of tough because what we would consider literate today in 2001 is probably different than what they would consider literate in 1861, 1862, or 1863. Uh, we get this data actually from the 1860 census. That is one of the things the federal government looked at. So we do have that data here. Um, also, another way I do that, if the guy leaves a memoir after the war and I can't find him in the census or he leaves a letter or a diary, well, clearly he is literate to a certain extent. So we included that there. So what we're looking at, the idea that a Confederate soldier, at least in this regiment, is this kind of dim-witted country bumpkin, well, you know, not really. I mean, we look at when the war breaks out, 88% of these men are literate. At Gettysburg, 84% of the men in the 26 North Carolina ranks are literate. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. But here's an example of literacy in the 1860s. The example right here is from Private John Setzer of the 26 North Carolina. Uh, you can see that it's very phonetic. Uh, you can read it, but it's a bit of a challenge. Then we look to the left. Uh, this was a letter written by Lieutenant John McGilvery of Company H, written just a few days after the battle to his father um, from Winchester, Virginia. It's actually gonna be published in the Fayetteville Observer. Um, the one thing I do wanna point out here is he's gonna write, our brigade, Pettigrews, that day was opposed to the Iron Brigade, never, never having been repulsed before, so I heard some of their prisoners say. But said they, we were compelled to yield this time. One asked what men fought them on that, that day in that certain part of the line. Being answered, North Carolinians, he said, I don't wanna fight them again. Just wanna throw that out there for all the Iron Brigade partisans. That's what the Iron Brigade said. I'm not saying this. That's just what they said. But you can see the difference in literacy of these men. You're going to get very beautiful, wonderful letters. You will also see um, some that are very challenged to work through as well. So let's now look at kind of the backgrounds of these men. Um, you'll see here, head of the household. The majority of these men are not the head of their household. That makes a lot of sense. The less responsibilities you have in the 1860s, the more likely you are able to be a soldier. Um, that bears out in Union numbers, that bears out throughout Confederate numbers. Um, so we will see that, at the, that really the data from 1861 to Gettysburg is pretty comparable. But I want you to look at this middle section right here, 1862 to 1863. In April of 1862, the Confederate government is gonna pass the Conscription Act. This now makes individuals eligible to be drafted into service. So what we begin to see are men that might've been politically sympathetic in 1861, but for various reasons will not be fighting. They are not joining 1861, but they are being compelled to join in 1862 and 1863. So look at just the head of the household rank jumps from 27% in 1862 up to 43% in 1862 and 1863. So you can see the impact that the Conscription Act has on these men and the regiment. Let's also look at marital status. As you would expect, only a quarter of these men are married in 1861, roughly. 75% uh, are not married. But look at how that shifts in 1862 to 1863. So what we begin to see is in many ways, the men that joined in 1861 are kind of the, the, the quintessential boys of 61. But by 62 and 63, they really get replaced by the men of 1862 and 1863. So you begin to see a change in the regiment there. Let's also look at, uh, were these men parents or not? Um, once again, 
less than 20% in 1861, up to 36% in 62 and 63. So we can begin to see this impact coming into play. So let's look at also their occupation. You know, John Lane goes back and talks about these men were not aristocrats. Most of them were farmers and the numbers bear that out. Almost 60% of these men were farmers in the ranks. This 24.9%, the unskilled workers, uh, a lot of these are considered farm laborers, um, manual labor, if you will. Um, but really the vast majority of the 26 North Carolina are coming from an agricultural background. Even the skilled workers you see, um, you have one of my favorite jobs they have is a guy that's a turpentine getter. He works in the naval stores industry, tar pitch and turpentine. Um, so that's an agricultural pursuit. So really the vast majority of these men are coming from an agricultural background. Now let's start to look at kind of wealth for these men. Now, the challenge that we have is that the numbers we use are, are kind of arbitrary in some respects. $1 in 1863, for instance, is about $20 in today's money, just to kind of give you a, a reference point there. So let's look at, at these men. Um, once again, 61, some of these men do have a personal estate. Very few though own real estate. A lot of these men are still living with their families. Um, so they are not in the census considered owning that property. Let's look at now the uh, personal and household wealth. Now, um, the numbers right here, these are for your officers. As you can ex expect, these men are gonna be more well-to-do uh, compared to your enlisted men. So I have it broken down to the average of officers that have real estate, that's the property they own, the personal estate, that is the value of their household items. And then we have what I consider the total household wealth, the, the combination of the two. So what we look at is in some cases, you'll have a soldier. Good example of this is Henry Burguin Jr. Um, his family has a total household wealth of over $200,000 in 1860. Now, he doesn't have any to his name directly, but he is coming from that family. So clearly he is coming from a background of a upper level family. So to kind of just give some numbers here, um, what we're looking at for total household wealth for officers in today's money, um, we're looking at that's equivalent to the 12,500 figure equivalent to about $259,000 today. That's the equivalent in, in our money. Um, for the men coming from uh, the enlisted ranks, that drops to just over 62,000 in today's money. So you can see a big disparity between officers and enlisted men, which we would kind of expect to see. So let's also look at class, where are these men being pulled from? Uh, I use the definitions of lower class, middle class, and upper class. These actually come um, from Joseph Glathar's soldiering in uh, Robert E. Lee's army. A really interesting book if you've never looked at it. I think it gives you a really good insight into um, the makeup of Lee's army. So I kind of went with his numbers because I think it's kind of a standard number to use. So let's look at Gettysburg. 48% of these men are from lower class families, basically $800 or less as a total family value. 31% uh, coming from the middle class, about 20%. So fairly evenly split here. You'll see also the uh, how we look at in 1861, only 43% are coming into the army. That makes a lot of sense. If I'm not coming from a wealthy family, if I leave the household, that has an impact. Losing a hand on a farm is a big deal. So you see, in 1861, more men coming from middle class homes, upper class homes than what you're going to see later in the war. So let's look at the average household value by company. Um, you will see the ones that really stand out, Company H and Company K. Um, these are Moore County and Anson County. Um, these are Anson County for one has a very high percentage of families. Um, that are from slaveholding backgrounds that we'll look at a little earlier, but you can look at the really the poorest counties. Um, company F, that's Caldwell County, that's up in the mountains. Company C, that's Wilkes County. Company A is Ash County in the mountains. Uh, what's interesting is that Company F and Company I are both raised in Caldwell County, but we can see a disparity 
between the two units in terms of average household uh, by value. So you do see some disparity just in the counties themselves. So now let's kind of look at um, look at the socioeconomic class by company. Uh, the obviously the most of these men are coming from low income uh, families, lower income socioeconomic levels. But then we're going to see you know you do have a pretty solid contingent of middle class. Look at Company G, uh, for instance, at Gettysburg. Yeah, fifty one percent of these guys are middle class there. So kind of an interesting figure there. Now I wanna show a map of, of the slave population 1860, because this is gonna factor in. Remember what uh, John Lane said, many of these men did not own slaves. So we look at obviously areas where we would not expect heavy slave populations in the mountains of North Carolina. So we have that segment of the 26 being raised right here. We've got another segment, Wake County, Chatham County down to Moore County. But then we have this area here with Union and Anson County. So we do have some differences there. So let's look at the numbers. Um, seven, in 1861, about 75% do not own slaves and they do not come from a slave holding family. Um, by Gettysburg, we're looking at almost 80% of the men in the ranks do not own slaves and do not come from a slave holding family. Um, so you'll see those numbers uh, beginning to, to change. You'll look at, of course, 1862, look at that, 86.4. Once again, that shows these men are coming from lower class, middle class homes that really, that's kind of the differentiation between being middle class or upper class in the South is your ability to own another human being. Um, as horrific as that sounds, but that is kind of that dividing line, if you will. So Lane is correct in that. Um, and you'll see percentages of slave holding by company. And these are men coming from slave holding families or own slaves themselves. You'll see company K over a quarter coming from that. Overall in Joseph Gladthar's work that he looks at for the army in Northern Virginia as a whole, he puts it at about a quarter of the army in Northern Virginia comes from a slave holding home or own slaves themselves. So for the most part, the 26 is below average in the army in Northern Virginia as a whole, really other than Company K from Anson County. So now let's look at the military profile. So we see who these guys are. Now let's look at their performance because when we look at Gettysburg, what the 26 does here, it almost defies logic. They lose about 650 guys on July 1st. They lose over 700 in this battle between July 1st and July 3rd. How does this unit function? How does it continue to operate? So one of the things that we can tell is looking at the service records of these men themselves. So let's first look at when these men joined the ranks. Of those here at Gettysburg, 55.8 joined the 26th North Carolina in 1861. 35%, almost 36% joined in 1862. Only 8.4 joined in 1863. So what this is showing is that you have a bulk of soldiers that are getting as much as two years, a year and a half of service. In fact, one of the sort of myths of the 26th North Carolina is that they are a green regiment. Well, they've only had a brief appearance in the Army of Northern Virginia up to this time during the seven days, but I would not consider them a green regiment. They have been through battles such as Newburn. They've been at Malvern Hill. They have been at Newburn at 63, the Siege of Washington, and then of course here. So in many respects, the average members of the 26th North Carolina, when they go toe to toe with the 24th Michigan on July 1st, I would argue the men of the 26th North Carolina have more experience in the ranks than the men of the 24th Michigan. Now, same can't be said for the rest of the Iron Brigade, they're gonna see much more combat, but at least in the case of the 24th Michigan, I would put the service of the 26th above them in terms of experience. That's going to matter. How does a unit survive heavy casualties and keep its cohesion? It's by having experienced men and experienced officers. So let's look at the age of these men here at Gettysburg when they enter. Uh, you're going to see in 1861, the average age is 22 years old. But you'll see 62, that jumps up over 
up to 24.5 years old. By Gettysburg, the average age in the ranks is about 25.9. So, you know, you do see a really the bulk of these men are really 16 to about 27. That's really where a lot of the ages fall. Although we do have men in their 40s here in the ranks of the 26th North Carolina, but um, the youngest we have is 15 years old here in the ranks at Gettysburg. So what can we see about the regiment as they enter the Gettysburg campaign? First, the average age of their field officers is 23.7 years old. Now, a lot of that is driven by Henry Burguin, their 21-year-old colonel. Uh, but John Lane, their lieutenant colonel, as well as John Thomas Jones are both in their mid-20s. So this is still a very young level when you're looking at field officers, um, probably one of the youngest average ages of any regiment here at Gettysburg. The average age of a company officer, so your captains and your lieutenants, 26 years old. The average age of an enlisted man here at Gettysburg is almost 25 years old. But I think what really gets into the heart of why they perform the way they do, 92.8% of field and company officers have between one and a half to two years service experience. You are hard pressed to find a regiment here at Gettysburg that would probably equal that number. Why? Well, if you go through the meat grinder of Virginia in 1862 and 1863, the lifespan of a officer in a unit is not very long. They're going to be killed. They're going to be wounded. They're going to be captured. The 26th North Carolina misses out on battles such as Second Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville. So it allows this nucleus of officers and NCOs to remain in the unit. That's really going to be the glue that holds this unit together here at Gettysburg. Um, I think that's the really the critical factor that explains how they perform the way they do. When Bergwin is mortally wounded, John Lane replaces him. Lane is coming in with a, as a very competent experienced officer. When Lane goes down on July 1st, Major John Jones takes over. He has about the same length of experience as Major that John, that John Lane had as Lieutenant Colonel. So there's not a tremendous amount of drop-off in terms of leadership when you look at the regiment. And that's going to matter here at Gettysburg. Of the men in the ranks, 52.8% of the regiment has two years service experience. Uh, that's a lot of time. Now, you'll say, well, yeah, but they don't really have combat experience as much as other units. And that is true. But as I point out, they were at Newburn, they were at Malvern Hill. Um, so they do have that. Um, and they also have a lot of experience campaigning in Eastern North Carolina. But one of the critical factors that I find in the 26th North Carolina is that Henry Burguin really molds and shapes this regiment into being a very efficient fighting machine. L Bergwin loved to drill his troops. Uh, he's a professional soldier, and the 26th is going to be one of the very best drilled regiments you will find anywhere. So when it comes time to face heavy combat, like they're going to see on July 1st and July 3rd, being well drilled, having a cadre of really experienced officers and NCOs, it allows this unit to almost, I don't want to say go into autopilot, but function as seamlessly as possible against that friction of combat. I think this is something that we can look at to, to explain how they're able to perform as well they do with the heavy casualties. We have a quarter of the regiment has one to one and a half years of experience. Only 13%, almost 14% of the regiment has six months experience. So the bulk of the men in the firing line are experienced, trained soldiers here at Gettysburg. But all the experience, all the training in the world can't prevent desertion and AWOL in the ranks. And one of the areas that I think has not been studied as much as it should be in the Gettysburg campaign is the number of North Carolina troops that are leaving the ranks in May and June of 1863. And if we look at the numbers, as I traced for the 26th North Carolina, what you begin to see is other than that late period of 1865, January to, to March, the highest period desertion 
or men going AWOL in the ranks of 26 North Carolina is right here, May and June of 1863. 49 men are going to leave the ranks during this period. Now, we can understand why we see 30 men leaving the ranks after Gettysburg. That is pretty easy to see. But this is before the battle. Almost 50 men leave the ranks before this battle. That's a significant chunk of a regiment that's still going to bring in 904 men to the battle. So why do these men desert? Why are they leaving? Well, one, they know a battle's probably imminent. Uh, when they arrive in Virginia, uh, they are going to see the aftermath of Chancellorsville. We actually have a number of great letters of these men marching through the fields of Chancellorsville, seeing unburied bodies, burned corpses. Um, very much a, a unwelcome sight to these men that in some cases had not yet served in the Virginia Army. Um, so they are going to be, some of these men are probably going to be rattled by that. Also, they know if we're going on campaign, there's probably going to be a big battle. There's a chance I could be hurt or killed. I just don't want to do that. I'm going to leave the ranks. So what are some of the causes? I found 29 identified desertions between June 3rd and June 28th. Nine of those are going to occur on June 16th. 12 occur between June 18th and the 20th. So if you just kind of look at those numbers, these men are still in Virginia at this point. They have not crossed the Potomac. If you're going to do it, you got to do it before they're going to cross. Now, what I think is interesting is we look at where the bulk of these men come from. 50, almost 56 percent come into the unit in 1862. Over a quarter of them come in 1863. The vast majority of these men are most likely conscripts. So these aren't the guys that in 1861 are rallying to the flag. In some cases, these men are being brought in sort of against their will to want to fight. So you could look at maybe is their um, support for the Confederacy as strong as it might be. Who knows? But that's kind of an interesting number. Also, these men are coming from households that are in the lower income level. So we only see the average household value of these men is $677. 44% of them were married, head of the house or a parent. If you're married, you run the house or you have a kid, you have responsibilities. These are things that can weigh heavy on an individual. So I don't think it's a shock that we see that the bulk of these men are coming from that background. Also, it's regional. All but three of these men are from Western North Carolina. We often talk about the unionist sentiment in Western North Carolina, which at times I somewhat question, but it is an interesting factor to look at that it breaks down pretty strongly on geographic lines. So these men from Western North Carolina also easier to desert if you're going to the mountains, more places to hide, any number of things. So I think this is an area of the Army in Northern Virginia that I think really deserves a lot more attention and research than what we have. Are these deserters in the pre-Gettysburg time? We understand when they leave after the battle. You can understand that, but I think it's a very interesting group, those that leave between Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. Certainly warrants a lot more study. So let's now look at the strength of the 26 North Carolina when they come in here to Gettysburg. So we do have a wonderful photo here. Uh, you probably recognize the monument in the background there. That is the monument to the 24th Michigan. The individual standing right here is Lieutenant Colonel, later Colonel John Lane. Uh, the individual standing right here is Sergeant Charles McConnell of the 24th Michigan, later head of the Iron Brigade Veterans Association. And the individual in the middle here, is William Burguin, Henry's younger brother. Uh, now, William was not with the regiment here. He was in the 35th North Carolina during the Gettysburg campaign, but he later, along with John Lane, really become two of the critical figures in shaping the early history of the 26th North Carolina. So I think a very neat photograph that we have here um, on the Gettysburg battlefield. You also, I just wanna point out, look at how open the ground is back there. Um, far cry from if you walk through there and say June or July today. So all told, I have been able to put into the ranks of the 26th North Carolina on July 1st, about 904 men. Um, you will also see the losses that these units suffer here. Um, the kind of gold numbers are their overall strength. The burgundy numbers are going to be their losses.
Now, one of the areas that, that we see is it's often talked about that at Gettysburg, the Company F from Caldwell County loses 100% of their men here. Well, not exactly. Three are going to come out of the battle unscathed. Now, how do we sort of look at that number compared to what's been published before? Just because you have, say, for Company E or Company F, 97 men in the ranks, 104 men on paper, does not mean that you're going to have 104 men in that company or 97 men in that company. Troops get detailed. You're going to have guys being teamsters, cooks, any number of things. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have 904 guys coming into the ranks. A lot of the letters and diaries and memoirs of the 26th North Carolina places their battlefield strength, so combat strength, at about um, 850 or so on July 1st. So, and, I, and that's 850 muskets in the ranks, not counting officers. So it kind of gives you a sense, this is a very big regiment. Uh, to give you a sense of what they looked like when they were moving down on July 1st towards Willoughby's run. So if we look at that number of, you know, 904 guys, you split that into two ranks, ultimately their frontage is going to be about a quarter of a mile on July 1st. Just imagine that a quarter mile regiment coming towards you. So um, not a pretty sight for those guys from Michigan and Wisconsin and Indiana that are watching them move down towards them on July 1st. So let's look at the casualties uh, that they're going to suffer at Gettysburg. 113 killed in action. 36 are going to be mortally wounded. Uh, 30 are later going to be mortally wounded, but are also captured and will die of their wounds. Six are missing in action. Um, 360 wounded, 175 wounded and captured, and we have about 42 captured. Now, these numbers are a bit challenging because what we have are, are most of the men captured are going to be captured on July 3rd. That makes a lot of sense as they are in the failed attack on Cemetery Ridge. They're going to be falling into the hands mostly of the 12th New Jersey, although we have the 14th Connecticut rounding up some, some 26 prisoners as well. Of course, the 12th New Jersey is going to capture the 26th North Carolina's battle flag on July 3rd. Third, to my knowledge, we do not have a 26 North Carolina soldier captured on July 1st. The bulk of the men, though, that are wounded and captured, these are men that are wounded on July 1st. As Union forces begin to move to the West, they begin to come upon Confederate field hospitals, and that's when these men will then be captured. So generally speaking, if we look at the numbers, most of the captured July 3rd, most of the wounded and captured tend to be casualties from July 1st. So you'll a lot of times see men that are listed as being captured July 4th, July 5th, July 6th. Those are going to be the bulk of those men captured on July, from being captured from wounded on July 1st. So what is the impact of all this? You know, what does this do to the regiment. And I wanted to include the photo here. This is actually taken from the 1913 reunion. Um, this is the Iron Brigade's tent. And I want you to look right here. Welcome to the 26th North Carolina. One of the things that I think is very interesting is that I often say the fight between the 26th North Carolina and the 24th Michigan is probably the most intense regimental level combat of the American Civil War. The numbers bear that out. Um, all but 100 of the, of the 24th Michigan make it out of the woods on July 1st. You're going to have over oh, 650 men of the 26th North Carolina casualties. So I think there is very much a respect that develops between these combatants because in some ways your enemy is the only person other than your comrades that can understand what you went through. So we do see this here. In fact, I have a letter from John Lane writing Charles McConnell where they're actually discussing at one point a joint monument on the first day's field, um, a Iron Brigade Hall of History, this massive monument, and they would have on that monument commemorating uh, a portion of it to the 26th North Carolina. Of course, that never comes to fruition, but some interesting talk in the 1880s, 1890s. So just I think a really cool photo here. So let's look at the impact of the battle. 
Let's first look at the social impact. 185 men of the 26th North Carolina are going to lose their life as a result of the Battle of Gettysburg. And that's not counting the men that later die in prison. This is just men that are going to be killed in action or die of their wounds. Because of Gettysburg, 33 wives become widows. At least 88 children lose a father. That gives a different dynamic when we look at casualties. You know, it's easy to say 700 or so casualties, 13 casualties here or there. But when you look at it from a social impact, 33 widows, at least 88 children losing a father, that puts a different spin on the way we look at casualties. I can only imagine what the overall numbers for the Battle of Gettysburg would have looked like if we look at it through that reference point. If somebody's got a lot of time and energy and they want to sort through that, I would love to know what that final number is. But we can just see the impact just on one regiment here at Gettysburg. I want to focus on two families here. And often when we talk about the 26th North Carolina, you'll see the Coffee family of, of Caldwell County it gets a lot of attention um, because of the impact it has on them. But I want to look at two others. One is the Kirkman family of Chatham County and the Muse family of Moore County. All four Kirkman brothers serve in Company G of the 26th North Carolina. Henry will die of wounds received on July 1st. Wiley is going to be wounded and captured here. He is later going to die of disease at Point Lookout. William Kirkman is going to die of his wounds here at Gettysburg. And George is going to be killed in action. All four sons of the Kirkman family die as a result of the Battle of Gettysburg. Another family that suffers a similar loss is the Muse family of Moore County. Their youngest son, Ashley, will be killed on July 1st. Of the three Muse brothers that serve in the war, three of the four will die. So you can see the impacts that this is going to have on these families. And this doesn't count the economic impact that it's going to have. Um, I think it's very hard to quantify what does the loss of a loved one mean to a family's economic bottom line? Um, that's one less person to help plant the fields. It's one less person to help the harvest. Or a soldier loses an arm or a leg. How does that impact their daily life? So we cannot really quantify, I think, ultimately the full extent of not only the social impact that this battle has on communities or the economic impact. But needless to say, it is immense. So there is that ripple effect that goes far beyond the actions here of July 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, 1863. So let's look at the military impact. The 26th North Carolina, as I said, enters the battle of about 904 men. From my research that I've been able to put together, I have found 762 that are going to be a casualty here on July 1st or July 3rd. That is a casualty rate of 84.3%. That puts them up in very rarefied air of the 1st Minnesota, the 1st Texas at Antietam, some of these heavy artillery units you see in the Overland campaign. Uh, the impact on the field officers, Berguin is killed in action. John Lane is seriously wounded. Even Major John Jones is temporarily wounded here, but he is gonna remain in command. Uh, after the battle, Jones is going to alternate between regimental command and brigade command. Uh, during this time, Captain Henry Albright of Company G, he is the only captain to make it out of this battle unscathed, uh, will command the regiment. Now, look at this for a moment. Major John Jones is commanding the brigade at times. As we know, Henry Heath is struck by a spent round on July 1st, so he is going to be uh, severely concussed. So he is in and out of division command here at Gettysburg and during the retreat. So at times when he cannot assume division command, Johnston Pettigrew takes over, then John Jones commands the brigade. Entering this battle, he's the third ranking officer in 26 North Carolina. There is nobody left in Pettigrew's brigade that can be of a higher rank than John Jones. You're having a major commander brigade. That's all you need to know about the heavy loss that Pettigrew's men are going to suffer here at Gettysburg. 33 of 49 company level officers were a casualty here. Companies A, B, D, E, F, and K lost 
every company officer. In some cases, these companies are being commanded by sergeants or even corporals here at Gettysburg. On top of that, they're going to lose approximately 60 men at Falling Waters on July 14th, further uh, adding to the total that they see here. So that 60 number does not count here. You might have some walking wounded, of course, that could be involved in the ranks, uh, but you do see that they have another battle to fight once they leave Gettysburg on July 14th. With the heavy casualties and the loss of leadership, um, needless to say, regimental and company level morale collapses. Um, you have a number of letters during this period where the survivors or those that might have been uh, furloughed that come back to the regiment. Uh, we have a great one from Noah Deaton from Moore County who was not here at Gettysburg. He rejoins them on the retreat and he is shocked by this large regiment that was pushing a thousand men when he left only has a couple, just barely over a hundred when he rejoins it. During this time, there are rumors that the regiment is going to be consolidated with others. It wouldn't take a student of the Battle of Gettysburg very long to go through units here at Gettysburg that are going to, from North Carolina, suffer heavy losses. Think about some of the losses, say, in the 2nd North Carolina Battalion, some of the men in Iverson's Brigade. The idea was maybe do we just merge these units together? Of course, for these men, they don't want to lose their regimental identification. This is what they identify with. I'm a member of the 26th North Carolina. I'm a member of the 5th North Carolina. I'm a member of the 13th North Carolina. So very soon, efforts to rebuild the regiment commenced. And I think what is really the impressive story of the 26th North Carolina beyond the loss they suffer here at Gettysburg, it's how they rebuild this regiment. How do you rebuild a regiment in the Civil War that loses 84% of its manpower? Well, what we're going to see of the 535 wounded and the 42 captured, eventually 347 come back, 60%. So these are veteran troops that will return to the ranks between July 1863 and May of 1864. Additionally, 134 men are going to join the regiment between June and April of 1864. So by the time they enter the Overland campaign, the 26th North Carolina is once again pushing about 700 men in the ranks. So this is a tremendous number to be bringing into the field for a Confederate regiment. Um, the 26th will always be one of Robert E. Lee's largest regiments, even up into uh, the very end at Appomattox. Of the casualties, though, at Gettysburg, who returned to the ranks, so out of that 347, only 39 eventually surrender at Appomattox Courthouse out of 120. So we see that even of those 347, the vast majority are either going to desert, be killed, wounded, or captured during the fight in 1864. I often say that as bad as Gettysburg is as far as combat among both armies, uh, the worst is really to come in 1864. Uh, but they still have 120 men at Appomattox Courthouse, and that is also factoring in the losses they suffered at Sutherland Station on April 2nd as the breakthrough at Petersburg begins. So they're going to suffer heavy casualties just about a week before, and then, of course, the natural uh, sort of fading away of these units. But 120 guys in the ranks at Appomattox is pretty big for Lee's army. So that is it. That is kind of, I think, a different way of looking at the regiment here. Um, as, as we say, we often look at what they do, but this is more of why they do it and what happened to these men. Um, so I think we're at, well, right on time. Um, it's almost like I've done this before. Uh, so right now, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the role of the 26th North Carolina here at Gettysburg. Uh, the numbers we have, or their service throughout the war. Um, as I said, this is a topic that I'm incredibly passionate to talk about. Um, I do not have any family connections to the 26th North Carolina, uh, but I've often joked I've, I've been with these guys researching them so long that I'm tempted to file for a pension for the state of North Carolina um, at some point. Uh, so right now, you know, thank you all for attending, and right now, happy to answer any questions uh, you might have here. Eric. Wonderful pre presentation. I don't see how um, you should write a book. <laughs> I should, shouldn't I? Uh.